We need to really do our cities differently, that people should be able to have convenience stores and coffee shops and all of this and public transit within walking distance. So, so that, that, that is also something that, that we learn when we have those car-free days. Uh, and it is really important because it is showing all of a sudden people see it. Uh, same thing with the open streets. People see what it is. And and I love the fact that all of the changes that Mayor Hidalgo is doing, uh, including the 15-minute city and all of this, yep. because it's showing that it's doable. It's right. doable. Most of these transformations of streets around the world is not a technical issue. It's not a financial issue. It's a political issue. It's a political. It's very inexpensive. When, when elected officials say that they don't have the money, It's because they don't want to do it. Because at the same time, they are wasting money in a lot of in flyovers and in other things for cars, when with a fraction of that budget, they could do everything to improve the streets for people walking, cycling, or using public transit. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is the one and only Gil Penalosa, founder and chair of 880 Cities, uh, ambassador for World Urban Parks, and president of Gil Penalosa and Associates, a consulting firm. We talk a little bit about the early days in Bogota, Colombia, when Ciclovia evolved into a worldwide phenomena. And then we talk a little bit more about uh, life in Toronto and his recent run for mayor up in Toronto and the necessity, the urgency we have to transform our cities into places for people. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Gil Benulosa. Gil, it's a pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, absolutely. I've been dying to do this uh, for some time now. And uh, we, we do have an international audience. And so there might be a couple people who don't really know who you are. Let me just give you the floor and give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Well, um, I'm Gil Penalosa. I'm originally from Bogota, Colombia. Before immigrating to Canada, I uh, worked in the, the public sector and in the private and in NGOs. In the public sector, I led the construction of over 200 parks. Also, of taking a small program called Ciclovia, that is open streets that had was dying with few kilometers, few miles, and we increased it to 121 kilometers, about 75 miles. That every Sunday and holiday. Uh, it opens to people closest to cars, and we get over a million people. I've been in Canada now for 23 years. I created 880 Cities, a nonprofit, about 17 years ago. Uh, it has a simple but powerful concept. Is what if everything we did in our cities had to be great for an eight-year-old and for an 80? Uh, not 8 to 80, but 8 and 80 as an indicator. Then it will be good for everybody from zero to over 100. And also, I've been doing a lot of international work. I have worked in over 350 cities in all continents. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, you and I have met before. Um, you may not remember it because it was a rather interesting uh, opportunity for us to meet. Uh, we were both up in Pittsburgh at the... Um, the Walk Bike Places conference up there, and you had just finished giving a, an amazing keynote presentation, uh, rousing applause, and then the fire alarm went off. Do you oh, remember yeah, that? Immediately, as soon as it finished, then they said, okay, now people out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the closing keynote of the event. So you were the closing keynote. It was, it was key nice that it was just after I finished. <laughs> You were the closing keynote, and and we were sure because there there was an opportunity for for Q and A or or anything else. We literally it, it it was a fire alarm, and we all had to exit. And so you and I were standing uh, out on the sidewalk, uh, just kind of hanging around, talking and wondering, are they going to call us back in or not? And uh, I think I made something, uh, a comment to you, something to the effect of that you brought down the house and you were you were on fire. You were too hot for the audience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that's one of the key things that I, I think is is 
something that is really distinguished about you as an advocate and as somebody who is a change maker is that you have been giving keynote presentations. Uh, gosh, it must be well over a decade, maybe two decades now. Talk a little bit about that because, I mean, it, they really are inspiring uh, presentations and keynotes. Were you trained as, as a presenter? Well, I do. I, I try to become as good as possible. I've, I've been, I, I'm certified by the U.S., the American uh, Professional Speakers Association, uh, because basically I want to be able to deliver as well as possible. And once you get on that stage and you get a, five, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand people, uh, how to get them not only excited, but how to get them to understand. So mixing the words and the tone and the images and the photos. And also, like many people that go to the conference conferences, they are already on board. But they, many of them are almost giving up. Uh, they've been hitting themselves against the wall too much. And so how to recharge their batteries, how to give them energy, how to show them examples from all over the world that the transformation is doable. Also that we are in the middle of a huge crisis. Uh, now we have COVID. So how are we gonna create cities post COVID? Are we gonna go back to 2019? or are we gonna create cities differently? And we got this gigantic climate change in front of us and, and we are still not changing enough. So, so, so somehow, uh, yes, the, the, I, I take it very seriously, the, the delivering the keynotes and parallel to that, doing leading workshops and one-on-one -on -one talks and, and whether it's uh, for people that are on board or for people that are not, uh, how to find the proper arguments, how to, and how to give the people tools so that when they go and advocate, they will be more successful. I love that too, is and you're finding a way to connect uh, many with many different people across uh, many different sectors of life. Uh, and uh, obviously, when we're at a conference, it's a little bit of a self-selecting population. It's, you know, we're all kind of drinking from the waters and, and all of that. But you've, you've also been participating um, over the many years in uh, more high tech types of, of platforms and everything. And I'm going to pull up a, a video of a much younger you here. And uh, this is uh, a, an old street films that is is kind of looking. At, wait a minute. Who's that young guy? <laughs> <laughs> and so th this was a, a, a wonderful video that you, uh, you know, were, were starring in, uh, I think Clarence Eckerson and, and some of his, his groups from, uh, street films, you know, put this together. They went down and looked at Ciclovia, uh, tell a little bit of the story of, of Ciclovia and why that has been so profound in cities around the globe, around the world, because it really did change things because it helps, I think, people see their streets in a different way. Yeah, well, exactly. I think that's, that is why it's so important because I think to have a successful Ciclovia that is calling in Bogota or open streets as it's called in most other places, all you really need is people and streets. And every city in the world has people and streets. So it's, it's how, how to do it. When I was commissioner and I, uh, actually it wasn't even under me, it was under the commissioner of transportation. And, but they hated it because the, all the people in transportation, they were about cars, cars, cars. Yeah, yeah. And then it was becoming smaller and smaller and just had a few miles and a few thousand people. And in uh, five years, we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park every Sunday and every holiday. So about 64 days of the year, uh, it opens up. And by the way, when I tell people, whenever you can make a change, do as much as possible because you never know. People say, oh, no, we can go slow. People already changed their minds. No, people have not. Any change in cities needs a champion. The reality is that in 2020, we had 75 miles, 121 kilometers, and today we have exactly the same. It has not increased by one single uh, inch. 
So, but this is important because, I, and I've been talking about it in the hundreds of cities where I've worked and have helped many cities get it on board because it's not about recreation. It's not just fun and games. It has many, many benefits, especially when it interconnects the whole city. Uh, yeah. One, we realize, we remind people that the streets are public space. And as public space, it can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. Uh, and that is very, very important because the streets are about 20 to 30 percent of the area of our cities. So it's very important to say, look, we can have better uses. Also, it's good because it's about social integration. It's about interconnecting the whole city. One of my ambitions was that it was only in the up, middle upper income area of the city, the few miles, and I increased it to the poorest areas of the city so that everybody would connect and, uh, uh, as equals. Also, it's a great equalizer because right. the bicycles do not segregate, the running shoes, the walking shoes, they don't segregate. Uh, so everybody meets. And, and that is another thing that I thought that it was very powerful, that you get everybody meeting as equals. Uh, it's the only place where the owners and CEOs of corporations and their families meet with their minimum wage workers and their families are equals. And that is very powerful. And actually, my idea came from New York. When I became commissioner, I was reading the biography of Frederick Olmsted. Olmsted did most of the major large parks in the U.S. and Canada. And one of the things that he was saying, he said in New York, Everybody, 170 years ago, everybody hated everybody. The blacks and the whites, the rich and the poor, the immigrants and the locals. And he said, we need to find places where people meet each other as equals. Uh, the reality is that the, the CEOs and owners of corporations and the minimum wage workers, they don't live in the same buildings. Their children don't go to the same schools. They don't even go to the same restaurants. We meet to, uh, to meet as equals. And then I thought about it and I said, well, actually, any city, anywhere in the world could have that effect of meeting as equals uh, and, and, and the physical activity and the benefits to health uh, if we use the streets. And, and, and that's how it began. And I've been helping cities around the world. And it is it, really, really important. And I tell cities, it's really important to do it weekly. And if they are winter cities, OK, do it from May to September uh, throughout the summer. Uh, but if you do it weekly, because then it, it, it gains popularity when people know that it's every Sunday. So it's not, is this Sunday? Is this not? Is this summer streets? No, they know that it's every single Sunday that is happening and that gets more people. Also because the health benefits, both mental and physical, are a lot more when it's weekly. Because one of the things that many studies have shown is that if you are doing this on Sundays, uh, the, it is more likely that also you are going to be physically active on the weekdays. Also, people realize how short the distances are. So uh, because many of the people that are in Bogota, one out of five people are on the open streets, over a million people. And people realize that the distances are really short, even the people that have cars. So then they say, oh, you know, maybe some days I'm going to use my bike or I'm going to walk. Or uh, uh, so, so it, it it has multiple benefits. Yeah, I love that you reinforced the the weekly aspect of it. It's it's that repetition and being able to uh, establish a, a habit, a routine that hey, this is what we do on Sundays. This is this is what how we go about this. The other thing that I really I mean, like I think about it's very important that people understand that it's yeah. not a, it's not a, about an event. Cities right. spend too much money on events, the 4th right. of July. They don't, no, it's much better the programs, the program, right. the daily programs, the weekly program, the monthly programs. But if it has continuity, it is much better for physical health, for mental health, for the environment, for everybody. Uh, so so I, I would recommend cities always to, not only with the open streets, but with anything to focus more on the programs. That, yeah, events once a year, very flashy, but sometimes they take up a lot of money and, and, and they don't really have the benefit that if, we, if, if you use the same amount of money by making it uh, throughout the year, making it a program, not an event. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And 
it, what's really great too about this concept of reimagining what streets are for is that uh, it gets to some one of one of your earlier points that you made too is that you know don't go incrementally go big do bold big things exactly sometimes they don't work when they are not big sometimes people do the open streets of one mile and they say we're going to see if it works no usually it doesn't work because yeah, even if you are running run one mile you get bored and then uh, go back and back and back if you are on a bike the mile is going to be just a few minutes uh, so so you need to make it long enough so that actually people cycling will enjoy it, people running will enjoy it, also that they're not bunched up and the other thing is because most of the people that participate is if it comes close to their home so right. if it goes within within 10 minutes uh, then they go. If it's not within 10 minutes, they don't go. Uh, so they lo- that's why I kept increasing and increasing and increasing it so fast uh, to make it all over the city because it was, in all of the service, it was very clear. So, so and people say, okay, how long, what is the distance? Well, 10 minutes according to whatever. If people are going to walk, so it's 10 minutes walking. If people are going to bike, 10 minutes biking. But, but it's important to be all over the city uh, so so that there is that connectivity. Also, I tell cities, uh, do it. There is no risk. There is no risk. I said, okay, why don't you do it in 2023? Even if you don't want to do it weekly, okay, start monthly, but with, with, with a certain frequency that the people know. Say, okay, we're going to do it May to October, the first Sunday of every month. So everybody knows. Okay, at the end of 2023, if it didn't work, okay, don't do it anymore. But if it works, then in 2024, do it weekly, every single week. Of course, it will be ideally from 2023, they do it weekly. But but it is important to have, and to keep in mind, you're not, you not investing in gymnasiums or arenas or buildings or whatever, no. So the, so the, the risk is very, the, the, the cost is low, the risk is low, but the benefit is very high. So, so it's worth yeah. trying. And I've seen it work in cities of 50,000 people, cities of 100,000, a million, 10 million. It works equally well. So this is not something for the big cities or the small ones or the poor or the rich. It's extremely successful in wealthy cities like Paris. And Paris does it 52 weeks of the year, including in the winter, as it is in cities that of lower income like Bogota or Mexico City. Uh, and it, it works in large ones and small ones. So if uh, I, I, I love the example of Paris because sometimes people say, oh, but we don't want to be like Bogota. Okay, but you might want to be like Paris. Uh, so not? they're a little bit snowy. That's fine. Uh, this, this works equally well for everybody. And, and you, I'm glad you brought up Paris. Um, I, I had the uh, privilege of being in Paris in 2015, uh, when uh, Mary Hildago had her very first car-free day. And so I was uh, there for a week and had the opportunity to film uh, throughout the city uh, and, and really get a sense of what the city was like with cars everywhere. And then on that Sunday, be able to experience the car-free day in, in Paris and to be on the Champs-Élysées, which is normally just choke, choke full of cars and be able to experience it uh, just with people, you know, all throughout and really, again, reimagining what the streets are for. And so much has happened. So much has changed since 2015 when I was there. And it was interesting, too, because I went back the next day, that Monday, and stood in the middle of the Champs-Élysées and just filmed. And what was astounding, Gil, is the noise. The noise was just deafening. One of the things that I love about open streets is, is that one is the level of noise is nothing. It's amazing. All of a sudden you're people. walking down the main streets and you are chatting as if you were inside a building uh, and you don't need to be screaming while with it's full of cars. Everybody is screaming because it's hard to hear with all that noise. Uh, and it's good to measure the noise on, like so we do that regularly in many cities, so let's say at noon uh, on a Sunday during open streets and in the same place Monday at noon, uh, we measure the noise and we measure also the quality of the air so that people also really right. see the difference. And, 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 and it's 
totally different. And and I think that it's um it, so, something like the car free days. And again, when you mentioned doing it big, some cities say, oh, on car free day, we're going to do three blocks. No, it's not about three blocks. Why don't you do citywide? Even as an example, uh, what does the city look like? And and I, and I tell them use it almost as as a, as a teaching day that that people will learn the week before get the children in the elementary schools to start doing drawings. That's that what does the city look like without cars? The people in high school do a little bit of research and then they will find out that we've been here for hundreds of thousands of years, and it's been a hundred years since the car arrived. Uh, and 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 so it it, it serves to a, a philosophical, a, a thinking day, and do a citywide. And then when you do a citywide, then you realize how good or how bad your public transit is, how walkable or how bikeable, and, and what, what are the conditions. It's, it's, it's almost one day a year that you can shake people up, uh, or other cities now, like Bogota is doing like five per year. But, but even if you just do one a year, it's, it's a day to think about what is the role of the car and, and how are we living, which is something interesting. Now that we're in COVID, when many people were working from home, many people liked the idea of working from home, but they realized that it was very hard to get their basic needs within walking distance. And they realized that we need to really do our cities differently, that people should be able to have convenience stores and coffee shops and all of this and public transit within walking distance. So, so that, that, that is also something that, that we learn when we have those car-free days. Uh, and it is really important because it is showing all of a sudden people see it. Uh, same thing with the open streets. People see what it is. And, and I love the fact that all of the changes that Mayor Hidalgo is doing, uh, including the 15-minute city and all of this, because it's showing that it's doable. It's right. doable. Most of these transformations of streets around the world is not a technical issue. It's not a financial issue. It's a political issue. It's a political. It's very inexpensive. When, when elected officials say that they don't have the money, it's because they don't want to do it. Because at the same time, they're wasting money in a lot of in flyovers and in other things for cars, when with a fraction of that budget, they could do everything to improve the streets for people walking, cycling, or using public transit. Yeah. And you talking about bold moves <laughs> and big ideas. I mean, I mean, I, I love this uh, this website, this landing page for your your recent run for for mayor of Toronto, and the reason why I love it is there the the screen that's flipping through here is a lot of what we just talked about. You just we were just talking about streets for everyone and parks for everyone, and how that is so important that you know we do have that sort of approach where you know the city is for everyone. And you break down those barriers that, that we, you know, that we have, that we self-impose on ourselves. And uh, it, it's just so, I was super, super excited when in the summertime it was announced that you were running for mayor up there. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes. Well, and, and we were keeping our fingers crossed. And I know it was a really hard fought, uh, you know, campaign. You came in second place and you did a fantastic job. But that's exactly what you were talking about is having the courage and the political will to do bold things. And exactly. it's that, important. And it, yeah, that, that was really bold. <laughs> yeah. And I, at the beginning of the year, wasn't planning to run, but I started calling the people that I thought should be running. Yeah. And the, the, the current mayor was running for reelection. And I called one and the other and the other and everybody said, oh, no, he has too much money. He has too much power. Uh, nobody can beat him. I said, but it's not just about beating him. It's about raising the conversation. It's very, very clear that the city is going in the wrong direction. In the, He's been mayor for eight years. And in the last eight years, we're less affordable, less equitable, less sustainable. We need to raise some issues. And then when, when no one was running, then I made the decision to give back to the city and dedicate some time. And from the start, of course, I knew that I had no chance unless the mayor made a big mistake, which he did not. But nevertheless, uh, since the day that I registered, when I probably had 100 votes or family and friends, 100 days later, I got 100,000 votes. 
uh, yeah. which is a lot of both. That's more than any mayor in the metropolitan area except Toronto. And But more important, I wanted to change the conversation. Like even people kept telling me all the time, no, you got to make a, 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 a simple slogan. You just got to say, oh, let's get back to the ABCs, uh, four of all, beautiful and clean. I said, no, no, anybody can say beautiful and clean. I, I want to talk to people about how we can solve the housing crisis, how we can solve mobility, how we are going to make walkability and bikeability, how can we do public transit? And and it was very interesting because we did change the conversation in, in many, many ways. It would have been a very, very boring campaign with the mayor just talking about uh, the, the cost of living and and we and actually he's been there, there less than a month and he already brought up a uh, housing policy and almost every issue that he uh, put where was the housing policy that I had and which he had never done anything about it in eight years. So so I think that without me having day after day after day talking about this housing for everyone, uh, he would not have done it. He would not have been pushed into it. And, and I, so I think that from the point of view of changing the conversation, it was important. And I, it, was, it was really about giving back. Of course, the, it was very risky. If instead of 100,000, I had gotten 5,000 votes, people would have, said, would have made fun and say, oh, you see, it's not that simple. Uh, or also people started making up all kinds of stories and uh, people are, and, and, and making lies and things. So. So it was risky, but nevertheless, fortunately, it went well. And I do think that there's a lot of people in the city and, and, and media people that realize that there are a lot of solutions. One of the things that made, I was very concerned is that when I talk to the people, especially young people, they're almost giving up. They say, oh, things are going to be like this. And I said, how can we get all of these people that are hopeless to move them into being hopeful? Uh, we can improve the cities. See, things do not have to be the way they are. Uh, these are political issues and we can change it. And, and we see like Mayor Hidalgo in Paris and, and Mayor uh, Veliag in Tirana, a, a city, in a, a wealthy city and a poor city. And both are doing huge transformations. So, so, so I think that it, 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 was, it, it was interesting, it was important, I enjoyed it. It was very, very tiring because it's uh, 24-7, literally. But, 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 but I think it was, it, it was a good experience. And when, and, and when I came up with the slogan of Toronto for everyone, it was also because when I asked people, uh, what do you think of Toronto? And then the young people will say, oh, it's good, but, but for the older people, not for me. I asked the older people and they say, oh, it's good for the young, but not for me. Uh, everybody said it was good for someone else, but not for them. And we each more and more were having a huge problems of equity in the cities, equity almost on everything. Like people say, oh, Toronto has really nice tree canopy. Yeah, but where the, it's 28 percent tree canopy. But where the wealthy people live is over 50 percent. Where the low income people live is 5 percent. So even in the in the amount of trees, it's a huge problem of equity, equity on mobility, equity on parks, equity on, on programs, on activities. And that is also something that in cities all over the world, we really need to focus. When I look at maps of New York or Chicago by, by zip code, it's really incredible that within the same city, uh, even life expectancies, a, a really basic measurement that measures many, many things, life expectancy. In some zip codes, the life expectancy is 60 years. Right. And 10 minutes away is 90. And I said, yeah. how can we have 30-year different li life expectancy 10 minutes apart? It looks like if it was uh, neighborhoods in almost not only two different continents, but almost two different planets. Right. Uh, and it's right in the same city. And, and, and obviously that, that must be very concerning because it's not, when we don't have cities that are good for everyone, uh, usually there are cities that are not good for, for no one. Yeah, yeah. And if we uh, go over to your, your main website here and we, we take a look at, at some of the, 
the things that you've been up to over the years, one of the things that that I hone in on is, you know, two things. You had mentioned, you know, the founding of of 880 and uh, we, we also have the urban world urban parks and you just you just mentioned it there is you have these huge disparities that based on zip code based on where you live do you have access to a park within a, an easy walking distance do you have tree canopies in your area are you subjected to massive amounts of traffic violence and and exhaust and noise from, from, from cars. And so it, it's so incredibly important to, you know, when we think of that, a city for everyone is, is looking at some of that data and saying, okay, well, where, what does the tree canopy look like in this neighborhood? What is that park? Is that park accessible? Is that park uh, inviting does it have the tree canopy, you know, necessary and many other things? And then what is the exposure to uh, pollutants and toxins and, and other toxic elements like noise pollution? Such a huge part to be able to think about huge. that. Yeah. I, and like even when you look at the streets, I, 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 when I was meeting with the boards of it, the editorial boards of the main newspapers, uh, I, I, I said that I was going to make citywide, citywide, the maximum speed limit should be 30 kilometers an hour, which is 20 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, citywide. Uh, why? Because we got to make them safe in the neighborhood street. There is absolutely no reason why the neighborhood streets should not be 20 miles an hour maximum. Uh, and basically, if you get hit by a driver with a car at 20 miles an hour or 30 kilometers an hour, there is 5% probability of being killed, 5%. If you get hit at 35 miles or at 50 kilometers an hour, the probability is more than 80%. So it's radically different. And it was curious, sometimes this, this editorial boards were asking me, oh, but how are you going to enforce it? It's so difficult. It's almost impossible. And I said, look, all of you in this editorial board, you live in the nice neighborhoods of the city. What is the speed limit on those? In all of them, it's 30 kilometers an hour, which is 20 miles an hour. How do they enforce it? Very simple. They got two or three humps in every block and they have speed cameras, and they have road dias. Why is it that only on the wealthy neighbors of the city, all of the wealthy neighbors of the city, the speed limit is low, but in the rest of the city, the middle income or the low income, the speed is much higher. Don't they think that also the low income people wanna live in neighborhoods that are safe, that the children are not scared because they, they, they might be killed by a car? Uh, so that those are also, uh, issues of equity that we need to improve substantially, and that is doable, completely doable. Yeah, yeah, S such a such a very good point, and 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 to your point earlier too that this is not a technical issue. This is a political will issue. Exactly the the speed limit, and, and we see cities like Oslo, Oslo. Last year has zero pedestrians killed, zero, zero cyclists killed, zero people in car. Why? One of the main reasons, because they lower the speed citywide, all of the neighborhood streets. And in the big streets, the arterials, they also lower it, not to 20 miles or 30 kilometers, a little bit higher, but also they lower it. And then it saves lives. So if people can be patient and spend one or two minutes more uh, on their way to work or wherever they're going, uh, we are going to have better quality of life for everyone. Uh, so, so this is something that we we must do, and and we the, the common good must prevail over the, over the particular interest. And 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 this is doable. Like over COVID, over COVID, we saw a lot of good lessons to learn. For example, in Oakland, California, in Oakland, California, they created the slow streets. What is the slow streets? It's, the streets for the neighborhood is only for the people that live in the neighborhood. If you are going from point A to point B on an arterial and there is a traffic jam, you cannot cut through the neighborhoods. The neighborhood streets are for the people that live there and only at 10 miles an hour. So all of a sudden, the neighborhood streets became safe and children were playing and older adults and people with disabilities and uh, 
then the mayor came out a year and a half later and said, well, now do you guys want to go back to how we were? People said, oh, no, no. <laughs> what do you think? After more than a year of no noise, of clean air, of no danger, now you want to go back? No, over 90% of the streets, the residents said that they wanted to keep it as low streets. So these are the things. Also, during COVID, we saw when, when city after city after city around the world when they said, when, when people had to stay home, there were lockdowns, all of a sudden buildings that you couldn't see because the quality of the air was so horrible or mountains in the background or other things. Just a few days of few people driving, people staying home, and all of a sudden the quality of the air became so clean. It was so visible and it's really uh, uh, inspiring in some ways, but also terrifying that you see the cities uh, before the lockdown and after the lockdown, it was almost as if God had sent a message. If you want clean air, this is the solution. It's really, really simple. You're going to have fewer cars. There is no other way to do it. But nevertheless, many cities are going back to 2019 when we know that over 800,000 children are dying every year because of bad quality of air. Over 4 million children are having long issues for life because of bad quality of air. And, and we have the solution. Uh, we saw it. We saw it every city around the world. So why are we not doing it? So, so yeah. th this is something that is also a little bit that, 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 that generates anxiety. How are we going to do it? For, I, I think that we should involve public health in, in everything we do. I think that the post-COVID city, every decision that we make, the width of the street, of the sidewalk, the speed, we should evaluate by, by, by what is the impact on health, what is the impact on equity, and what is the impact on sustainability. So, so if if that is, that that is the issue, it's not. Uh, so, so we we cannot continue growing as we are. I mean, we need to realize that the cities that we've been doing in the last fifty years are not good for mental or physical health. They're not good for the environment, for climate change. They're not even good for economic development. So, we need to do things radically different. Uh, so, so this is a great opportunity uh, for people to change. Uh, so, unfortunately, too many cities are going back to 2019 right. instead of taking advantage of this opportunity. I mean, cities like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, all of them were invaded by the cars in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s. And they had a situation similar to COVID that was the oil crisis. When they had the oil crisis and people couldn't use their cars, maybe one day yes, one day no, by license plates, uh, then they started cycling, but they didn't have facilities. So a lot of children were being killed and the citizens were doing huge demonstrations in front of city hall every time someone was killed. And they forced the, the decision makers to build networks of protected bikeways. And then we saw how it went see places like Copenhagen. Uh, when they started building the protected bikeways, about 5% of the trips were on bike. And now it's about 45% citywide. And in the downtown, it's more than 60%. But it's because you have the infrastructure. We need to have that infrastructure. Uh, so the way we do the streets has to be radically different. For example, trees. We need to have trees everywhere. We also saw through COVID that when we are close to nature, uh, we live healthier. We need to have benches. I've seen some cities in the U.S. that they have taken out all of the benches citywide. And the mayors tell me that it's because of the homeless. And I say, what, the homeless? You think this is um, th there is magic? You take out a bench and a home shows up? Uh, I said, the homeless now is going to sleep on the sidewalk. But instead, many people with disabilities, uh, children, adults, especially many older adults, they will not go out if there are no benches because they want to know, they might, not, they might never even use them, but they want to know that if they get tired, they want to be able to sit. So, so, so we need to rethink and make sure that the streets are really for everybody, for people that are walking and cycling and using public transit and using cars in that order, but also for people with disabilities and for people of all ages. Uh, and, and so, so, so th this has to be uh, a, a rethink 
but not only think, but we need to do, we need to act. And, and uh, some cities are moving in the right direction. Most are just talking and not doing enough. Are doing small pilots. No, we, we don't need more. In most of the cases, we don't need more pilots. We need this is action. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you have a program called A Walk in the Park with Gil. And, uh, and you, you bring in a bunch of these people who are, you know, they're walking the talk, they're doing things and they're, and, and you bring them on and you talk about them. Talk a little bit about, you know, you know, the experience that you have, because when I, when I click on this on the past sessions and I look at some of these, uh, wonderful webinars that you have put together, uh, how many years have you been doing this now? Well, uh, two years, and two years? basically yeah. the idea, it, it's called a walk in the park with Gil, but uh, as of January, it's going to be called Cities for Everyone with Gil, because some ah, people are confused, and they, they thought that a walk in the park, it, it was because it was going to be only about parks, and we have had guests like Young Gil, <laughs> has been, and Mitchell Silver, who was commissioned in oh, New yeah. York, but also he was the president of the American Planners. And uh, we, we had so many people, David Sim, and yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, Brent Todarian, the head of planning in Vancouver. And actually yeah. this year, we're, we're going to start on the, the, the in January with Carlos Moreno, who's the head of the 15-minute city 15 in Paris, city, yeah. close yeah. advisor with Mayor Hidalgo. And we're going to have Jeff Speck, who just came out with the 10th year edition of the Walkable City. That is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, And the idea, the webinar is every other week on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's always free, always with fascinating people that have helped, have done themselves, have helped get things done. Uh, Because I, I value a lot the people that get things done. Because too many people talk, but but sometimes there there is not enough doing. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's always free. It doesn't have any sponsors. Uh, it is taking me much more time than what I expected. But again, I also feel that it's it, it's a way of, of giving back. So if I can call up Brent O'Darian or Jeff Speck or yeah. Jan Gell and ask them to do it, uh, so and people are able to, and it's very international. I always have about one third Canadians, one third Americans, and the other third is from maybe 20 different countries. So that, yeah. that, 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 that is the focus on, on the webinar. Yeah, I love it. There's 29 different episodes out there, folks. I'll be sure to include a link in the show notes and in the video description below. And they're fantastic. And again, the very, very much, uh, it, a little bit like this in, 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 in some sense, but then you turn it over to your guest and they basically give a little mini lecture. And it's it's a wonderful way to learn, uh, like you said, from the people who are out there getting stuff done and really the thought leaders at the forefront, uh, you know, around the world. Good stuff. Yeah, it's about 60 minutes. And it basically almost half of it is a presentation. I ask them to use lots and lots of images. Yep. And then the second half is a dialogue, including questions that people from the audience send. Uh, and it's uh, it's interesting. I said, well, if after six months I don't have 50 people, then I'll stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, it's always over 200. And we have on average about people from 25 different countries. And, and it, it's really interesting. I think that is like like this, like active towns is uh, it's it's about it, everybody. I, I think that something that is really important is, and that's why when you invited me immediately, I said yes because I think we need to share. We need to be more generous. Something that is really really important is that we are talking about cities or towns or streets. Uh, Everybody benefits. Everybody benefits. So let's let's share ideas. It's not sometimes people forget that this not it's not like in the private sector. I mean, if if I'm making mugs and and I uh, have twenty percent of the market of mugs and I want to go to twenty three percent, well, someone has to lose three percent of the market for me to gain three percent of the market. But if someone like Oakland, California, did a really good program of slow streets and I go and see what they did, and I learn from them, and I adapt it to my city, they don't have to get any worse for me to get it better. So it becomes a win-win. So yeah. when someone is doing I, I tell them it's not like on the computers that we copy and paste. No, but it's adapt and improve. 
we can all learn from each other, both on things that work as well as things that did not work. So when we see that Oslo went to zero uh, traffic incidents, uh, traffic deaths uh, by lowering the speed, okay, let's analyze what is it that they did, how do they do it, were there any issues, what were the problems at the beginning, at the end, and so on. So, so I, I do think that it's very, very important to learn from successful stories. And what I love about what you just said there too, Gil, is that the examples that you're using are pulling up examples of where these transformations are taking place. These were not easy decisions, you know, and easy things to do, but it did take that political will. It did take bold moves to be able to, like in the case of the city of Oslo, uh, of saying that, you know, hey, we need to decrease the uh, number of vehicles that are coming into our city core. And they went through a process of not only lowering the speed limit, but also decreasing by dramatically the number of parking spaces available and then the um, number of vehicles coming into the city core. And so these are bold visions. And you also mentioned, you know, Copenhagen and also the cities in uh, in Amsterdam, or excuse me, the cities in the in the Netherlands, including Amsterdam, you know, they they had their moments. Like you said, they had their their huge moments that were similar to like what we experienced um, in COVID. Uh, is it was a reset button. It's like, oh. We need to rethink how we're doing this. And I especially love the Dutch example in the sense that uh, the image that people have when they say, oh, we can't be like them. We can't be like them. You know, it, it's always been like that. No, look at the photos from the 1950s, 1960s and into the 1970s when that cultural shift started to change. Those cities were clogged with automobiles. So they had to incrementally go through that process of changing. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah, it's very important for people to realize that it's not about copying. It's about adapting and improving. And and they need to, for example, Bilbao in Spain. Bilbao Mm -hmm. saw what was happening in Oslo. They went there and then they adapted and they went also to 30 kilometers or 20 miles an hour citywide. Mm -hmm. Uh, So sometimes when some city has done good things, it's good because Often politicians find it difficult to make decisions or convince citizens when they think they are pioneers, maybe because they think that pioneers get shot in the back. Uh, but then they say, oh, no, look, Paris, Paris eliminated 50,000 parking lots. So they say, wow. So Annie Hidalgo is, is taking away 50,000. She had the guts. Of course, some people complain. The decisions is always hard. It's not only in your city, it's every city. Everywhere it's been hard at the beginning. For example, when you make pedestrian streets, always you make a pedestrian street. In Mexico City, they created the downtown Madero, one of the main streets connecting the Central Square pedestrian. And everybody complained, everybody hated it. Blah, when, they, when they announced it, once they did it, then all of the other streets are begging the government that they also want to be pedestrian only because the businesses in the pedestrian only is way better than in the other in the others. So, so it always takes uh, a little bit of leadership. But what people need to realize is that we are not doing well. We're moving towards climate change crisis, uh, and, 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 and it's bad. And we also have an issue of public health. And for example, too many people talk about Obamacare or Trump care or now Biden care. The reality is that no health system is going to work if it's only curative. We need right. to be preventive. And having uh, streets and parks and trees and nature uh, is part of it. I mean, for example, when people are uh, looking for the magic pill, uh, well, the magic pill doesn't exist. The magic pill is called physical activity. Mm-hmm. And the only way that large groups of people are going to be physically active, the only way is by walking or riding bicycle the, as a normal part of everyday life. There is yeah. no other way. I mean, yeah. people might, might play soccer once a week. People might play tennis or golf or walk out of the gym or whatever. But we need them to do it five or more days a week. And the only way... Uh, is walking or cycling. And, and around the world, the only way that cities have done it. So if we know that that is going to be good for depression, for anxiety, for strengthening the muscles, the bones, osteoporosis, uh, for the heart, for the, for the strokes, 
for, I mean, it has multiple benefits. We need to make it very, very, very easy and simple for people everywhere to be able to be physically active as something that is easy and enjoyable. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's sneaking activity into our daily routines. You know, when you have an environment, a community that is, uh, that is safe and inviting for all ages and abilities, it, it gives you that ability to, you know, be able to, oh, we need to go down to school. We need to go to work. We need to go to the grocery store. Oh, we can easily walk. We can bike. It's, it's, you know, you're sneaking activity in without it being exercise. <laughs> you know, you exactly. don't have to get that's, dressed. That is the idea. That, that yeah. is what we need to do. If people after we want to go running or whatever, yeah. out of enjoyment, that's perfect. But it's not because they are doing their 30 yeah. minutes. No, their 30 minutes is part of everyday life. For yeah. example, the schools, most schools around the world, they are eliminating the cars that are moving in front of the school and even around the school. So they are closing those streets, even the whole day, or 90 minutes in the morning and 90 minutes in the afternoon when the children are going in or out. Uh, so they need they need to drop them off around. And if they are small kids, they need to walk them. But it's about creating that area that is safe. So it's about inviting children to actually walk or bike to school, getting all of the intersections within whatever half a mile or whatever from, from each elementary school and making sure that, that it's safe. Uh, doing the road dials and the crosswalk and the lights and, and, and everything. So it's not something that is hard, but it's something that we need to give priority. But, uh, and we know, for example, that when the people are driving their cars to the elementary schools, to the drop-off area in front of the school, we are poisoning the air. That air is toxic for the next two or two and a half hours. So the children that have classrooms near that drop-off area are going to be breathing toxic air for two hours every day. Uh, how is it that we don't realize, okay, let's eliminate the, the drop of areas in front of classrooms or in, in front of the administrative offices. I mean, th these are things that really make common sense, but sometimes like they say, common sense is the least common of the senses. That's uh, right. But, but, but it, it is something that we, we need to do and we need to work on making sure that everything that is public is totally interlinked. Uh, we need to make sure that all of the schools are open, at least the outside, the outdoor areas of the schools are open for the community so that people can use them. I've worked in many municipalities. I've worked in over 70, 80 cities in the U.S. Uh, for example, working in, in states like in Texas, I went to many schools that have these 10-foot high fences, and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when the, when the school is closed, they put a lock and they don't let anybody go in. Uh, and at the same time, there's a huge problems of obesity, of lack of physical activity, heart attacks, strokes, and all kinds of things. And they got the schools. And the schools are public. They were built with public money. Why is it that they are closed after 4 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays and on holidays and on vacation? Uh, so, so we need to rationalize it and, and be able to uh, everything that is public has to serve. We need to have multiple uses. But that's part of the 15-minute city. Okay. Also, how is it that we use the same facilities for multiple uses? How is it that maybe one street might be full of cars from Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, but then on Sunday we're going to open it up eight hours for people to ride their bikes or walk or run or whatever. So the schools are going to be only for students during the daytime, but they might be good for uh, the community in general at night and on weekends and the libraries and the connectivity and all of this. That, that, that is part of what we need. We talk sustainability but then we don't live sustainable. And this, these are the kind of things. It, it, it's not that we are going to live any worse. No, we're going to live actually better. We're going to live healthier and we're going to live happier. But we need to live differently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, looking forward to 2023. What is on your agenda? What are you excited about to be uh, engaging in in 2023? Well, I'm looking forward because I think that cities uh, do need to change. So I hope to continue doing a lot of advising, uh, master classes, workshops, keynotes, 
And I want to work a lot with older people because I think this is something magnificent. I've worked with AARP in over 22 different states in the U.S. I want to work with older people everywhere because it's one third of our lives. And we have not really uh, realized maybe, you know, we need to think that, for example, in the U.S., the life expectancy more than doubled in the last 150 years. This is incredible. But now we have added years to our lives, but now we need to add life to those years. And some people have the mind that our life as older adults is the last two or three years when we become very dependent. Over 80% of the time as older adults, we're very independent and people want to be physically active and want to contribute and want to have a purpose and want to do all kinds of activities. So I think that too many times the cities, they focus on how to develop activities for children and youth, but they almost do nothing for the people over 60. Uh, and, and I don't think that the, the people over 60, I mean, everyone should be able to live older, healthier, and happier. And part of it is infrastructure, but a lot of it is about programs. Older people, for example, suffer of loneliness, Loneliness because we don't organize activities. So we need to organize. It's not just about doing walking paths. We need to organize walking groups. We need to organize knitting in the parks. We need, in the wintertime, we need to organize knitting in the school so that we open classrooms to do that. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's really, really important. One third of our life is as older adults, a full third. But clearly, we have not li been living as well as we could, and, and the well-being uh, is not about expensive, it's, it's more about a change of mindsets. We need to sleep better, we need to eat uh, more green base, uh, we, we, we need to be physically active, what we were talking about a, a, a while ago is very, very important, and if that physical activity is close to nature, it's even better. So in 2023, one, one of my goals is to do a lot of work on with decision makers in cities, and with groups of older adults on, on living older, uh, healthier, and happier. Fantastic. And I've got your, your website up here. And again, uh, you'd mentioned your master class, uh, strategic advising, which is what you're talking about right there. And of course, we've talked about uh, earlier to lead us off with the inspirational keynotes. And, uh, and we if we slide down, we can see, yes, you, you're all over the place. <laughs> you're a busy man. And what I also note about this is it's it, the, the services are offered both virtually and in person, which is obviously something that was incredibly helpful um, during the, the, the height of the pandemic is being able to shift over a lot of our, our content uh, this podcast and, and, and channel is a, is a manifestation of that. And it sounds like you, you have done a little bit of that as, as well. Uh, yes, that is, that, that is yeah. also something that is interesting that people realize that they can learn also through this. So I'm also going to be doing some intensive master classes on mm -hmm. four days uh, from Monday through Thursday, uh, 90 minutes each day, like uh, a general cities for everyone. And then eventually I'm going to do some specialized on parks and public spaces or on streets uh, or on sustainable mobility. But the initial one is going to be about creating cities for everyone. And then, uh, so, so I, I want to see also with small groups so that people have a lot of time to ask questions and have a dialogue with groups of 25 people uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, raise the level of the conversation, give people uh, examples of different ways of doing things uh, because we need to move fast. Right. Uh, so it's, uh, there, there, there is a sense of urgency. Yeah, I love it. And I love it too, because if it's, a, if it's cities for people, they're going to be active towns. There's going to be a culture of activity inherent in those cities. Oh, in, in everything. I, I, I think that the issue of the activity is I love when people go and play soccer and when people uh, do uh, play golf or whatever. But, but more than anything, it's about being active as a normal part of everyday life. That's how people walk to get their bread. That they walk to their friends in the neighborhood. Uh, they, they ride their bikes to go to work. Uh, they, they take public transit, so uh, they walk to the public transit. Uh, being active, uh, I, I think is if we need to make it as 
uh, as simple as possible because there is it's unanimous, regardless of the political regime, regardless of the size of the country or the world of the country, everywhere. There is agreement that we need to be physically active and it has to be 30 minutes or more, but it has to be five days or more per week. Uh, so, so active towns, that, that is really the solution uh, on many, many, many of these, uh, on these issues. Also, it's free and it's simple. Right. But yeah. what the cities can do is to facilitate. If there are sidewalks that are flat, that don't have barriers, if the crosswalks are safe and there is enough time, if it's a big intersection, if it has a small island so that people can wait in the middle, uh, if it has nice windows so that when you are walking, it's inviting you to walk and look at the windows, if the transit stops that have nice shelters for the heat of the summer or the cold of the winter, uh, so the, the, the active town, the cities need to facilitate, to invite, to encourage. But if uh, in the past we were building the cities, inviting people to use cars and nothing else. Uh, now I think that is very, very clear that we need to do, to invite people. It's nothing against the car, but it's that it's going to be better for everybody. Also because cars are very, very expensive. On average, in the U.S., the people that have a car as a mode of mobility spend 20% of their income uh, on, on operation. And if it's low-income person, it's 30% of their income. So that low-income person, 30% on mobility and about 40% on housing. So they got 70% and they have not even purchased a, a piece of bread. Uh, so if, if households could downsize from two cars to one or from one to zero, it would be as winning the lottery. And a lot of that is through active towns. Uh, and, and active towns doesn't mean that people are going to live any worse, uh, just the opposite. People are going to live better and they're going to socialize more and they're going to be uh, have better health. Uh, and, and it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a win-win for the, for the individual, for the family and for the planet. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Gil Penulosa, it has been such a pleasure and honor having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. All the best. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Gil. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> share it with a friend, leave a comment down below. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell next to it to customize your notification preferences. Uh, next week, I'll have another episode for you. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.